Good morning. Nice to see you all. So um, a few years ago, um, we um, did a program that looked at how to improve communication skills in oncology trainees. Uh, we did a workshop which was very well received and the former CEO of our hospital, Amir Rubin, who was very involved in trying to improve the eye care and patient experience, um, called me in and asked me if I would do something to expand the program. So we launched a series of communication skills workshops amongst uh, faculties and some trainees, some residents and fellows, uh, which was also well received. And um, last year, um, uh, our incoming uh, CEO, David Entwistle, called me in and said, uh, these things seem to be helpful in other institutions. Would you try to expand the program here at Stanford? So based on that and the fact that Stanford Healthcare was willing to support it uh, and uh, put some resources behind expanding a program, uh, we went ahead and developed a series of communication workshops, so-called ACES uh, is the acronym, uh, Advancing Communication Excellence at Stanford. I think I came up with that while swimming, which is when I do my best thinking. And um, we, um, we have now undertaken a whole series of pilot workshops which have been very well received. Actually, the first um, 70 or 80 that have, uh, individuals who've gone through this just in the past few, uh, few weeks have all agreed, we'll get 100% uh, uh, to that they want, would want more and that they liked it. Uh, they would recommend it to others. So it's been very positively received and uh, we're going to be uh, expanding the program after the first of the year uh, and we'll talk about that. And as uh, Matt mentioned, uh, it's now part of the funds flow for the department, which means that if a certain percentage of faculty uh, undertake the communication workshop, and I would encourage any and all of you to do this uh, because I think it's something that will help. It helps all of us, it helped me, uh, to improve our ability to communicate more effectively with our patients, their families, and frankly, with one another. Uh, indeed, a couple of the people who took this uh, the last time uh, said to me that they thought it improved their communication uh, with their spouse. So it's all the same stuff. <laughs> you know, how do you uh, listen more effectively? How do you do it in a way that improves your efficiency in seeing patients? Um, in fact, in going through these kinds of programs, it's been shown that you can in fact improve your uh, efficiency in uh, seeing patients in an ambulatory setting. That is, the throughput proceeds more effectively because you're using the time more wisely, you're listening more carefully, your feedback is more precise, and so you get through the interaction in a much more uh, expeditious manner. So, we have um, launched this because there is evidence that it can improve clinical outcomes. In fact, there are studies that show that uh, patients who perceive that their physicians are communicating effectively uh, are much more likely to comply with their uh, recommendations. There are a couple of landmark studies around this, including one that shows that women who, uh, who perceive their physician as effective communicators and compassionate uh, and empathetic are much more likely to follow through with chemotherapy and, in fact, have a better survival. So this stuff is important. It's part of what we all need and what we all do. There's also evidence that it improves uh, satisfaction amongst teams because the same sort of skills are the things that we all use to communicate more effectively with one another and our colleagues in other disciplines. Um, and uh, although the primary goal was to improve patient satisfaction, there's evidence that it improves physician satisfaction and, and uh, mitigates against burnout, which is kind of a, a hot topic these days. If you effectively communicate, you're much more likely to find that your role as a physician is more satisfactory to you at the end of the day. Uh, a lot of the larger programs in the country, such as um, the Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Clinic, which are 
uh, we all recognize patient first uh, institutions, which is why they rank so highly uh, all the time, um, have initiated this in part um, for patient satisfaction, but also because uh, they had evidence early on that it mitigated their malpractice uh, payouts. And in fact, both of those institutions and others have seen a dramatic decrease in their uh, payment. Why do we get sued? Well, one of the main reasons that comes up every time is failure to communicate as the uh, line in the famous movie goes. So this is a, 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 a substantial commitment and we're all busy, but uh, it is an eight-hour eight workshop, although there will be also programs where there are two four-hour uh, sessions separated by time um, that will be held uh, on campus and uh, there will also be Saturday sessions. And in addition to some didactic discussions, there's a lot of um, demonstrations, role play, um, and what we always ask is people bring in conversations that they have found challenging, patients that are difficult, uh, awkward conversations. How do you deal with those patients? How do you deal with their emotional response? How do you deal with your own emotional response in facing those uh, circumstances? And those are discussed, portrayed, reviewed, and people are coached through how those communications might, in fact, be more effectively conducted. I mentioned this, that there's uh, improvement in patient um, um, scores, uh, uh, increased empathy scores, decreased burnout scores, uh, decrease in patient complaints, uh, et cetera. So um, it, it really focuses on basic stuff. I mean, stuff we all know and do. It's really to take what we all do on a regular basis and refine those skills and give one a sense of perhaps some additional uh, 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 cues as to how to be more effective. So this is the first group of uh, individuals who are participating in as facilitators. We recruited 14 facilitators to go through a program uh, where they will facilitate these workshops. Each workshop would have two facilitators and sometimes one of us observing. Uh, and then um, it's a fairly small group. There's only like uh, six uh, physicians per, uh, per facilitator. And it's easy to sign up. Uh, there is a, um, a link that uh, you go to and, and uh, sign up. We will have completed the first 160 uh, individuals uh, through workshops through December. Um, after the first of the, which are full, but after the first of the year, this will open up and we're actually aiming to have as many as somewhere between six and 700 slots over the year. The incentive that goes uh, through the funds flow is looking for people to accomplish this by the end of August. So there will be um, eight months um, through the end of the so-called fiscal year in order to complete this so that the department and therefore all of you can be rewarded for this uh, financially. Uh, but I would uh, posit that, um, that the real rewards are, you know, what we all get out of this for practicing these, uh, these skills. So th I'd like to acknowledge our group, our team uh, effort on this. Uh, it's, uh, we really have a great group of people who have worked tirelessly to put this uh, uh, program together. I'd like to mention briefly that we're also expanding this program beyond uh, Stanford Healthcare. We're currently assembling a proposal, a center proposal, the Stanford Center for Health Communication, which will involve uh, uh, undergraduate medical education through the School of Medicine, gradu graduate medical education, so that we'll be reaching out more uh, to trainees, residents, and fellows. Uh, but also partnering uh, not only with Stanford Medicine, but with uh, Packard Hospital. Uh, and this will also link to programs across the university that are helping us refine studies, research, and fellowship training and communication skills. The idea is to also look at the impact of media, social media, digital health on how we communicate with our patients, the information that they bring to us in those conversations, how that affects public, public policy, and therefore, how does it affect outcomes? So that's, that's coming down the line. Any questions 
at this point, uh, Matt, and uh, yes. Do you, have, do you have evidence that this actually works? Yes, good question. Well, I, I showed very briefly, but we don't have time. There are uh, uh, considerable supportive data that this works. Um, and the larger institute, hmm? from a patient standpoint, improving patient scores, I just referred to a couple of them in the, in the in, uh, interest of time. But there, there is plenty of evidence that this impacts patient satisfaction, um, the top box scores, as we call it here, for our, uh, for our patient satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Likely to recommend, absolutely, that again, it has a lot to do with, uh, you know, at the end of the encounter, how do patients feel about the way you communicate with them. That's a lot of it. That likelihood to recommend, at least from the physician standpoint, is largely keyed to that particular issue. And that's been shown in study after study, particularly the large studies from the, the large centers. At the Mayo Clinic and at Cleveland Clinic, these are mandatory for everybody, it's not discretionary. Everybody who's part of the medical staff, whether they're a faculty or just, if you will, practicing on the medical staff are mandated to take these kinds of programs. And the reason is they've worked. They've shown that their scores are going up, that, um, that the physician satisfaction scores are going up, that the climate has changed, that there has been a climate change, in the good sense of the word, in, in their institutions. So these things, although they seem kind of almost soft and fuzzy, as it were, and not, if you will, hard driven, there are data that show improved outcomes, as I said, and in some cases improved mortality even from just being more effective with, with the way we communicate. Yes? The question was, is this available for trainees? Um, trainees can do this, and in fact, we encourage it, although from the funds flow standpoint, it's the number of faculty that take this that actually impacts that particular paradigm, and they'll be given, there'll be a lot more information about that. But we strongly encourage, uh, and in fact, we've had um, advanced care practitioners, nurse practitioners also involved in that. You may have noticed a couple of the facilitators are nurses, one of them with a PhD in evaluation, so they're, they're highly skilled. Um, we will be expanding, as I mentioned, as part of the center, which will give us some increased resources, uh, uh, programs specifically designed for groups of residents and fellows as we started. I mean, we started with that uh, a number of years ago. And we will be uh, insinuated into more of the undergraduate medical education programs here. There is some, as you probably aware for those of you who have been students here, uh, but, but uh, the Dean's Office is interested in our expanding those programs as well. Other questions? If not, I hope I've been an effective communicator. Thank you all very much. Great, thanks so much. Yep. Yeah, um, you know, Great, thank you. Um, I want to thank Dr. Hahn to uh, give me the opportunity to talk about education or what we've been doing in the last uh, couple of years. Um, but this is basically a, a talk or hopefully a discussion uh, about appreciations and opportunities. So um, this is going to be a short talk because what I'd like to do is facilitate discussions. Um, so I want to start from um, different realms, and the first realm is going to be for the medical students. As you know, that the medical student core clerkship has undergone a little bit of a change in the last two years. So Kara Liebert, as an education fellow, redesigned the whole curriculum to include uh, the flipped classroom. And for the last two years, based on student feedback, uh, it's been very well received. So uh, last year, um, we were tied for first as far as uh, the um, medical student core clerkship, and I think we're still in the running for uh, this year. The, when I'm talking about uh, opportunities, I want to thank everybody who's been involved in uh, the surgery interest group and have been involved in a lot of our pre-clerkship courses like uh, Surgical uh, 204 and 205. Those of you who don't know, um, our Surge 204 course is an uh, introduction to, to uh, surgery, which is created by Miriam Caret about uh, nine to ten years ago and has been going on ever since. It used to be a capped enrollment at 30, but because uh, of more interest from medical students, it's now gone up to, uh, we just opened enrollment, so it's now up to 59 this year. Surge 205 was also created by Dr. Kret and was run by Brendan Visser, 
And uh, it's a technical training and it's a skills course and it's been modified uh, over the years. Now it includes a mentorship program and I know a lot of you here have volunteered for this and last year you took pre students into the operating room and it was so well received. Um, Dr. Hahn promised that the, the medical students that she would raise the enrollment which we had capped at 25 uh, and we opened up to 30 last year, we opened up to 40 this year and we had 18 on the waiting list and we had people still um, emailing me to try to get in or at least try to find mentors. Uh, and then our own medical students who's been working at the Goodman Surgical Education Center has created a new course uh, called Service to Thr Through Surgery, uh, basically to fill the void uh, and the misperception that surgeons just take care of the people who are well to do. Uh, a lot of medical students who, after going through the core clerkship finally understood that if they wanted to do surgery, either global surgery or to serve the underserved, that surgery is probably the best venue to do so. So they wanted to go ahead and advertise that and created this, uh, this new course that we'll run this year. And then um, how many people have been asked by medical students to shadow? Okay. Um, in the past, it's been kind of difficult to discern what the, um, process was to get students into the operating room. So I wanted to spend uh, about a minute and a half on this. So uh, the medical students to, uh, in order to uh, scrub in the operating room need to get uh, training on the sterile procedures. So now uh, the Department of Surgery has actually started to own this program. Um, our Brittany Hasty from edu uh, our education fellow created and one of our medical students, Sarah Miller, created a program, a video and a training and all the medical students are now going through that in order to go to the operating room. If they're pre-clerkship students, they're going to require a red sticker on their badge, which uh, signifies that they've undergone the training, and they need one of you as far as attending surgeons to be in the operating room with them. So if they're a pre-clerkship student and they haven't yet gone through the clerkship program, they need to have a, uh, an attending if they're going to go ahead and help and be scrubbed in an operating room. And so the red stickers for pre-clerkship students and the, uh, the uh, green stickers for clerkship students. The students do have to refresh their training between pre-clerkship and clerkship and we do that with several trainings. Um, uh, before they become a clerkship student, there's a, in quarter six, the medical students all come and do training. And so we trained 100 students last, uh, last April. In September, we did a refresher course for the pre clerkship students, we had 29 uh, students in October, uh, early October, we had 29 students and just this last Saturday, we trained 38. The reason why I'm telling you how many, how many students that we've trained in our training is because uh, the interest in surgery from our pre clerkship students from just coming in and uh, first year medical students is going up. I mean, going up significantly. I think there's a thirst for what we do and the knowledge of what we do and there hasn't in the past been a venue to do so. So the medical students are, are not only trying to prepare and train in the OR, but they want to go ahead and find mentors. So if you get these buggy emails from me, most of it's because they go through me asking for somebody in transplant or in HPB or in surgical oncology or breast and I'm gonna send these people to you by email and if you're interested, all they need to do is just go in the OR maybe once or twice or shadow you in clinic and I think that uh, they'll be hooked for life. For general surgery core course, uh, Dana Lynn has um, solidified the schedule to split the senior and junior core course into uh, to, uh, the core course into two, which requires more faculty input. But I think, from what I heard last night with the se senior residents, I think it's been extremely well received, and the fact that uh, the faculty engagement has been extremely high has made it all the more better. And I think core course is getting better and better because of you all. The skills curriculum has been modified. Because if those of you who don't know, the first Tuesday of the month is now reserved for the residents to have time to focus on their research activities. So there will be no educational activities on those days. Um, I think Mary and Mark's uh, stipulation is that this time be used for research activities before PD and after PD years and not for um, doing an extra case or two. And uh, I think Mark can elaborate on that if, if anybody has questions. So the skills curriculum has been really honed to what we think that the residents need or want 
And uh, a lot of this has been from input from them. The Resident Educators course is a three program course that's for the interns and it's by different people and faculty in the School of Medicine. So today for the interns, Kelly Scaff from the Department of Medicine is gonna talk to them about feedback and about, the, uh, ab about teaching medical students uh, in an environment that is conducive to learning. Uh, we have started two years ago a Central Venus Line certification program which puts all the interns, I'm sure the interns are groaning about it, but um, puts all the interns through the training for Central Line and it's using the kits that we use here at Stanford and it's a, a full immersive simulation. I mean the, the models that we use are, take a little bit of getting used to and we've tried to modify that throughout the last two years, but it requires the uh, interns to not just learn how to do it but to test and if there are certain things that they can learn from their test, then we have them watch the video on things that they could improve and then retest until they're certified. Once they're certified, they get a card that goes on the back of their badge and they must do three supervised central lines before they're allowed to do them independently. The ICU here at SICU has been uh, involved in this certification process and they're not checking everybody's badge but if they do have a question they are going to go up to the residents and they have been in checking to see what the certification process is. Um, CT surgery just kind of got wind of what the program we've been doing in the last two years so have asked, the, asked us to go ahead and help them with their program and then Dr. Fishbein just pointed to me this yesterday last night and asked if I would do it for uh, anesthesia too but that's to be seen. I think most hospitals in the country have a, a central line certification program, but with the backing of Dr. Spain, we've been able to do this in the ICU in the last couple of years. And I, hopefully it, we're tracking outcomes and it's gonna take a long time to see whether any outcomes change at all, especially because most of the surgery residents um, actually do really, really well. Um, but we're tracking to see whether, uh, what our effectiveness for the program is. Dr. Spain and Dr. Wren have historically been the sole teachers for the ACS basic and focused ultrasound course that we offer to the residents, but now we have Daphne and we have Dr. Lynn and other people who are involved in this. And uh, it's something that most attending physicians have to go to the American College of Surgeons to get, but our residents get it here as part of the program. And then uh, our residents also at the first year and the third year level are being put through a robotic surgery program so the hope is that the first years will be trained enough to be your bedside assist when you do robot cases and that your PGY3s when they become fours when they're at the VA or at, the, uh, or at Kaiser or even here at Stanford on colorectal or MIS uh, or HPB will be able to go on the council because they've been trained. Of course under your supervision and hopefully with dual consoles. And then our cadaver labs have grown in number mostly from support from the outside, but mostly from the support of the faculty who actually um, have been great about teaching and that's one of, the, um, one of the things that the residents really enjoy are working with the faculty on the cadaver labs doing actual cases that they'll be doing um, next year. And then this is an idea that came um, out, uh, I wanted to use this as an example of how we can change the skills program based on what your needs are. Um, Clem Marshall sent an email around to, to all of us basically saying that there was a need for us to be able to, uh, as residents, to know how to do cricothyroidotomies in the hospital because uh, if there was a code, uh, we would be expected to, um, to respond and some of the residents felt uncomfortable with this particular procedure. So Ed Lee, one of our uh, education fellows, found a model with a pig um, cricothyroid membrane and thyroid cartilage, we made a model and we kind of piloted it at our last cadaver lab and Clem, I'm not sure, it sounded like it, it, was, it was pretty well received. Okay, and this is, an, I, this is an example of hearing what's needed, hopefully being able to provide that training and then having it be part of the skills program. And uh, so thanks Clem for those numerous emails. Um, and then I also wanted to cover what the American Board of Surgery requirements are for our residents to go ahead and, and qualify to take the qualifying exam. And these um, requirements are getting more and more and more and more. So FLS or Fundamentals of Laparoscopic Surgery, pretty much everybody knows. Uh, but the Fundamentals of Endoscopic Surgery is uh, now required this year. We've had three or four residents take this test already and have passed with flying colors, so thank you for that. Uh, FEC stands for uh, Fundamentals of Endoscopic Curriculum. So the board requires us to 
to teach to the residents at every PGY year a little bit about endoscopy. And then at the end, Dr. Melcher has a sign off that they've undergone a, a, a curriculum, but also has undergone uh, evaluations or assessments on doing colonoscopies and upper endoscopies. So those of you who do colonoscopies and endoscopies, uh, there is a form that Anita can give you, and also on our app, Scrub Hub, to do assessments uh, for the residents. Now the board, in numerous emails and communications by me to them, doesn't tell us how many needs to be done or whether they have to be done, um, but it has to be part of the curriculum, and it's part of their suggested curriculum, but it's still kind of, kind of fuzzy. So we've been providing them for our residents, especially on MIS. Andy, you had a question? Yeah, I know Tanya tried to do that a couple times, so yes. Yeah, so, so. Um, so we, we, we have it on paper, but we're correcting some of those uh, deficiencies. It's also, um, it, yeah, it's, it's a standard form, but we've also reproduced it on MedHub. So there is, uh, there is a form on MedHub that you can fill out too. So yes, the, the residents can go ahead and bring that to you. Um, they can get those from Anita Pratik or Patricia, uh, as well as, No, the residents, the, it, the onus is going to be on the residents. Uh, but the question is whether we need to do them at all, and this is going to be the first year. Uh, so to me, I'd rather be prepared than not. So I'd like to have, we should have. That's always a struggle for us, so I would encourage them. Yeah, I mean, so, so we're encouraging our residents to do it, even though we're not sure whether the board requires it or not. Because um, they suggest a curriculum, but they don't mandate a curriculum, so basically, uh, we have to sign off that one was done. And we're doing it through the skills sessions, so we are doing uh, and giving the curriculum. And then operative and clinical assessments, this has been going on for about two or three years now. So every graduating resident requires six clinical evaluations or assessments, these are on MedHub, and then six operative assessments. And uh, they can be any case by any attending. And uh, I know there's always a mad scramble at the end of the year for the residents to get it, but it, the onus again, Andy, is on the residents to bring these forms. Oh, no, uh-uh. No, I can't even do that, so. All right. So what I wanted to do was also talk about med, um, medical education faculty support. So the Clinical Teaching Seminar Series is a program that actually that uh, Laura Mazur helped create, and it, it has grown into a interdisciplinary um, program that goes once a month. So almost every specialty in, in the hospital, I mean PM&R and ophthalmology, internal medicine, OBGYN, pediatrics are involved in this. And it's medical educators or people who are interested in medical education topics to go to a seminar that's on the first Wednesdays of each month in this room at 5.15. It's kind of grown in the last three or four years. And then um, Laura also created a uh, medical education conference. And this conference is gone on now for coming up, it's gonna be the third year. Um, and this conference has been, uh, has pretty, been very well attended. The first uh, conference was on Memorial Day weekend and we drew about 100 people at the institution who was interested in education. Um, the point I wanted to make is if there's any topics on the schedule that are interesting, all you need to do is just show up. We have search strategies of med for medical education by our, our librarian, Chris Staves, who's, uh, who's kind of amazing at what he can do and, uh, and search for topics. But we have learning climate by Dr. Skeff, uh, survey methods by pediatrician, two pediatricians, Dr. Kelly and Dr. West from uh, UCSF, uh, qualitative survey data by our own Sylvia uh, Barekni Amiro, and then large group didactics by our uh, current interim um, uh, associate dean of education, uh, Neil Gesundheit, and then we cap it off with disseminations for strategy for medical education uh, by Pat O'Sullivan from UCSF. And then our conference is on June 2nd, so I'm plugging this. What, what I wanted to uh, also acknowledge is that last year's uh, medical education conference, our, our own Kim Kopecki gave a workshop on discussions in palliative care using a game. And then uh, also one of our medical students, Sarah Miller, uh, presented on a surgical skills curriculum for preclinical medical students, which is our Surge 205 uh, as an oral presentation. And then our upcoming, and then our, uh, we have a couple of residents who have done projects. 
who, uh, and Adam Sang has become one of our honor scholars, so he did all the requirements to get a certificate of medical education from the School of Medicine, and then Ashley Titan, uh, Joanna, and then Casey Church, who's an endocrine fellow, created a program for glycemic control, and that's still ongoing, and they're, they're gathering data. And then I'm gonna finish up by talking about a program um, that is a partnership between the Stanford Maine OR as well as the Risk Authority uh, and then the Center for Immersive and Simulation Based Learning. Um, this program has been about three or four years in the making and the reason why I'm telling you is because I have already um, begged a couple people to do this. Uh, and it's actually, I don't have to beg anybody anymore, I just have to ask people to participate. It's an interdisciplinary simulation program that happens in the operating room, and it's been kind of couched on Monday mornings when, um, when us as a division uh, do M&M, but it, basically what we're doing is doing interdisciplinary simulations in the operating room monthly, and then uh, followed by a 20 minute debrief, and then we do it in enough time where you can still get to your, you get to your cases and, and just follow on your day. So this is what we wanted to do was, this was intended to be the first case of the day on Monday, uh, even though most of us have late starts. I have one slide on the reason why the operating room and the, and the hospital wanted to do this, is that, uh, and the first one is a quote that I found, but this is kind of near, near and dear to my heart, this is why I spend a lot of time on this, is that, as health professionals, I see lots of people training, but they train separately. So the anesthesiologists do a lot of simulation, but they train separately than us. We have been starting to do simulation, and then the nurses and the ORAs and the anesthesia techs and the medical students all have separate training. So this is an attempt to bring all that together since we all work together. I think if we train together, there are lots of unintended benefits and intended benefits that could happen from this. And then those of you in the quality world know that most of the frequently identified root causes and the things that are near misses or sentinel events are almost always due to leadership or communication challenges that we have. Basically working in an interdisciplinary team and not always knowing who the leader is during a crisis situation. So this program is now uh, in its fourth or fifth month, and these are our program sponsors. So the Risk Authority has uh, been funding us, um, and then the perioperative executive leadership, especially Sarah Herks from education at the Stanford um, Perioperative Services has been uh, instrumental in making this work. And then everybody in the Goodman Surgical Education Center, the fellows and our various students um, have been involved in this. So that means getting up earlier in the morning on Mondays and uh, carting all the mannequins and stuff into the room. So our objectives are threefold. We want to improve patient safety, of course. Everything that we do here at Stanford is centered around patient safety. A lot of the debriefs that we've been um, having are finding problems with the system. Imagine that. Um, those problems that are identified, a lot of the participants are doing things on their own to correct them, but we're also having regular discussions with the OR leadership in order to try to get some of those pervasive themes that we've been hearing in the debriefs uh, into the system for improvement. And then team cohesion, I think, is also um, gonna be seen, and so those who train together, I think, will work better together. And so what we're trying to do is uh, change culture. The simulations are 20 minutes in the operating room. They're either at ASC or the main OR, and then they, a 20 minute debrief happens in an interdisciplinary fashion uh, in order for everybody to glean the roles and the concerns of everybody in the operating room when these things happen. And so um, Ed Lee, our education fellow, Lauren Alami, one, uh, one of our interns, and also um, Rachel from the uh, Department of Surgery here, our communications person, has put this, um, this little trailer together so you can get a little bit of flavor of what we're talking about and hopefully it comes out. And it's not very long.
So everybody always asks what data we're collecting. So we started to do pre and post simulation and written surveys and interviews. So those of, uh, those of you who have participated, we appreciate it. And um, one of our medical students, Paloma, has been um, conducting interviews uh, pre and post. Um, we've also are going to start an observation program in your operating rooms. So we've been asking permission from you all to have observers come in. Uh, and uh, it's an attempt for us to kind of gather what the culture of the operating rooms or, the, or our cases are baseline and then see whether things change over time. We intend this program to, to basically go on and be incorporated in standard work. So both ASC and Main OR are getting used to doing this every Monday and actually are asking for it sooner. Um, and, hope, and we might be able to get there at some point. Um, and then the culture safety survey, which we all are all fill out and is coming on board. We, we uh, are asking you to fill out the most current one because that will help us get a baseline um, kind of snapshot on what the culture of safety is at Stanford OR. And then some of our participants in filling out surveys afterwards um, have identified that this is something that they not only enjoy, they think is important. Um, a lot of people will come back at the end of the day and tell me that they've been thinking about what they w went through in the morning. and. Um, and I think a lot of the initial outcomes, although it's not hard science data, uh, what we've been hearing is that people after these debriefs are taking it on their, of, on their own to try to improve. One of our scenarios required a consult to vascular surgery, so it was identified that maybe we should have numbers that would be quick access to get vascular surgeons just in case we get into bleeding in the middle of the night or those kinds of things and we need some help. So Rosemary from the main OR has put together a list of quick numbers, not only for vascular, but for, for a, a lot of the other specialties in general surgery, uh, and it's at the front desk. There was a lot of people that didn't know that there was a blood refrigerator over in uh, ASC, so that you could probably get blood quicker at the ASC than you can actually get at the main OR. So this was identified in one of the debriefs, and so a memo was sent out to uh, anesthesia as well as to everybody in the OR to help everybody identify that that is a new process. And so we are seeing small changes that are happening with only the last four months of this program. So I'm learning a lot of language from the lawyers um, who are the risk authority, and so they keep on talking about return on investment. And for them, these are the things that are uh, what they're looking for in helping us do this program and funding it. So our next steps is we're hiring a full-time program coordinator simulationist because we have gone through four and this looks like this is something that's gonna be uh, adopted in the OR um, for all time to come. And so we've hired this person and she's gonna go ahead and start working in December. Uh, we've been asked to expand to insight simulations in additional perioperative areas uh, by the main OR and Honestly, I've been kind of staving them off for a bit because we want to make sure that this program uh, can take hold. And then the risk authority has asked us for, um, to submit another additional grant proposal in order to do this in all the inpatient units uh, for pre-codes and for the PACU as well as the pre-anesthesia holding area and cath lab. Um, but again, we're still in process of trying to solidify the, the infrastructure through the operating room at Stanford. And then uh, we stress interdisciplinary teamwork and communication, but these are only just some of the people involved in, the, in OR Intercept, um, from the Goodman Surgical Education Center to the risk authority to people in the Stanford Hospital. And um, what I couldn't do, what, which I'm, going, I'm still in the process of doing, is, is to put pictures together of all the people who have participated. So thank you um, all who have been responding to my 5.30 in the morning, um, texts and emails and reminders. Any questions uh, at all? Thank you for your attention.